Thank you very much for the invitation, especially uh, for Yasmin and Michele and for all the organizers. So first of all, I find it necessary to clear the very concept Wittgenstein's diaries, as I've often come across different interpretations and misleading uses of this concept. As we all know, Wittgenstein's Nachlass comprises 182 manuscripts or notebooks and 109 typescripts, which are considered as his philosophical writings. As concerns his personal reflections, that is to say, remarks occurring amidst his philosophical entries and scattered throughout his philosophical manuscripts, these ought to be labeled as diaristic remarks, but not as diaries. There are only two cases where one can speak of diaries. First, the left-hand sides of Wittgenstein's wartime notebooks, where he reports about his very personal situation in code, as against to the right-hand side, where he puts his philosophical reflections in normal script. These known as no notebooks 1914 to 1916, and considered as the basis of his logisch philosophische Abhandlung and the Tractatus. Second, in the case of one of uh, MS 183, it was incorporated by uh, von Richt later, and known as Denkbewegungen, one can also speak of a diary, which consists of 243 pages and contains personal, cultural, and also a few philosophical reflections. For the greater part, this diary is written in normal script, but as concerns very personal remarks, about his attitude toward religious belief or his fears of madness, these are written in code. Apart from these two existing so-called diaries, there might have been more. That is to say, a diary written in code entitled Abrechnung, which Wittgenstein gave his friend Arvid Schögren in the 1930s. Later Schögren gave the diary to Margaret Stomborough, but it has since been lost. According to Brian McGuinness, it is also possible that the manuscripts Wittgenstein left in England in 1913 and which he explicitly demanded to be destroyed contained personal notes. Further, it is possible that such entries were also found in the large book in which Wittgenstein, according to the reports of his students and neighbors, used to write at night in the 1920s. According to a note Wittgenstein penned in 1929, he began to write diaries in 1912, when he was in Berlin. It was an important step for me, he remarked. Among the reasons for writing a diary, he mentioned that it was partly the desire for imitation, in the sense of Gottfried Keller, partly the wish to write down something of his own, an endeavor he condemned as vanity, and partly as a substitute for a human being with whom he could speak to in confidence. In the course of his reflections on the nature of writing diaries, he remarked, what cannot be written, cannot be written, an indication of his awareness of the limits of language in writing not only on philosophical, but also on personal matters. And he himself makes a distinction between what he considers writing a diary and his philosophical entries, as can be seen from a passage in Philosophische Bemerkungen where he notes that he has accidentally left out two pages, which he now wants to use for writing a diary. And uh, this gives reason to ask what kind of text he thus considered. The various remarks on cultural, ethical, religious topics again and again occurring amidst his philosophical investigations. Insofar, one might consider all his diaristic passages as part of so-called diaries, even if not in a comprehensive form, as is the case with the coded part of the wartime notebooks, which can clearly be attributed to the category diary, and thus also the diary of the 1930s mentioned above, even though the majority of this diary is not in code and contains philosophical passages as well. In the same year as Wittgenstein was thinking about writing a diary, he also considered writing an autobiography with the aim at creating clarity and truth in all events for himself as well as for others. Thus his search for clarity and truthfulness as characteristic of his philosopher can also be discerned in his coded entries dealing with personal, mostly moral problems. Now I will talk about the Hisardo existing editions 
they, um, the well known are the, the, the wartime notebooks published as notebooks 1914 bis 1916. They comprise only his philosophical entries on the right hand sides of MS 101, 102, and 103, beginning on August 22nd in 1914 and ending on January the 10th in 1917. And these were first published by Georg Heinrich von Richt and Elisabeth Enskamp in 1960 in Schriften 1 by Surkamp. A revised and for some remarks extended edition appeared in 1979 by Basil Blackwell and a bilingual ed edition appeared in 1961 by von Richt and Enskamp with an English translation by Enskamp and a revised and partly extended edition appeared in 1979 by Basil Blackwell. Wittgenstein's personal and coded notes, however, on the left-hand sides of the wartime notebooks beginning on August 9th, on the 9th in 1914 and ending on August 19th in 1916 were withheld from the public and from researchers for many years. In the microfilm versions of the Nachlass, the left-hand sides were also covered up, decided by the trustees. In 1982, parts of the coded remarks were illegally published by Wilhelm Baum in the Zeitschrift für katholische Theologie. In 1985, the entire coded parts in the philosophical magazine Sava in a German-Spanish-Catalanic edition. And in 1990, the first German edition was published by Dorian Kant under the title Geheime Tagebücher, 1914 bis 1916. The publication of these so-called secret diaries evoked a great deal of discussion in the field of Wittgenstein research. It led to a scandal. The image of Wittgenstein as that of a dry and sober philosopher, known for his cool and detached way of philosophizing, was shattered. On the other hand, the insight into his personal problems led to a gradual understanding of the connection between his life and his work, and to his attitude toward ethical and religious questions. Unfortunately, it also led to an increase in the number of myths surrounding Wittgenstein, sometimes even to a distorted presentation of his personality. In 2015, Sul Park edited a Korean version of the complete notebooks 1914 to 1960, according to the original manuscripts with the rector sites, with the philosophical remarks, and the versa sites, with the private and coded remarks. Unfortunately, a German and thus original version of the complete wartime notebooks have so far been missing, however, due to the machine-readable version of Wittgenstein's Nachlass of WAP, researchers have access to the complete notebooks. And as we will hear from David Stern, he and Joachim Schulter are working on a project which will allow to get insight into the relations between Wittgenstein's philosophical notes and his personal coded diaries, and thus the path that led to the final text of the Tractatus. Since 2021, there is an English edition of the coded part edited and translated by Marjorie Dallaff under the title Ludwig Wittgenstein Private Notebooks. In 1977, Georg Henrich von Richt chose a selection of remarks from Wittgenstein's Nachlass, which deviate from the strictly philosophical discourse and published them under the title Vermischte Bemerkungen by Surkamp. In 1980, the volume was translated into English by Peter Winch under the title Culture and Value. And in 1994, Alice Bichler published a revision of the first edition by von Richt and in 1998 a revised and bilingual edition by Blackwell Publishing. In the editorial note of 1994, Bichler mentions that a considerable number of the remarks are partly or wholly written in code. However, apart from the coded remarks published in Vermischte Bemerkungen, there are a great number of further coded remarks in the Nachlass. In part, these are isolated remarks sporadically occurring in the midst of philosophical entries written in normal script, they do not appear to have anything in common with the philosophical context, but rather strike one as being something different and out of place. 
1993, Johannes Koder, the son of Wittgenstein's friend Rudolf Koder, informed the Brenner archives about a number of Wittgensteinian documents found in the literary estate of his father, among a typescript of the Tractatus, a manuscript of the Philosophical Investigations, MS 142, a manuscript of the Lecture on Ethics, MS 139b, there was a diary written in the 1930s. After having transcribed the text according to Max Witt, I published the diary in book form under the title Denkbewegungen. It has since been incorporated in a Nachlass as MS 183. Max Witt at that time allowed to present the diary in two versions, a normalized so-called reading version and a diplomatic version, which shows exactly Wittgenstein's movements of thought with all the changes, alterations, including his mistakes, orthographic or stylistic. In addition, the coded remarks are left in code and not translated into normal script, as is the case with the normalized version. The diary beginning on April 26, in 1930, in Cambridge and ending on September 24, 1937, in Scholden, in Norway contains personal and cultural reflections and a few philosophical ones. The parts written in Norway contain predominantly Wittgenstein's preoccupation with religion, in particular Christian questions, his attitude toward madness and his striving after an ethical way of life. These entries are predominantly written in code. In contrast to the wartime notebooks, philosophical and personal entries are not strictly separated by the categories of coded and not coded writing. Instead, the two different types of script alternate again and again over the course of the text. One might ask why Wittgenstein chose the device of a special form of writing for certain thoughts. Did he want to disguise them or give them a special setting within the context of his philosophical thoughts written in normal script? The following quote of a remark of Wittgenstein's should serve as a starting point or impulse, so to speak, for tentative proposals concerning the riddle behind Wittgenstein's code. It is strange what relief it is for me to write about some things in a secret script which I would not like to have written in an easily legible way. In view of this note and further remarks of Wittgenstein's, as well as in view of his refusal to treat certain tops topics in philosophy, I wonder whether in his method of encoding might have seen a possibility to write about matters about which he actually wanted to keep silent. This concerns personal, existential, ethical and religious questions, which he apparently wanted to conceal from superficial readers. A note penned in 1937 in MS 157a seems to confirm my assumption. There's a great difference between the effects of a script that one can read easily and fluently and one which one can write but not easily decipher. One locks one's thoughts in it as though in a casket. Searching through the Nachlass, one finds coded remarks scattered throughout, mostly only in the form of occasional aphoristic and fragmentary remarks sometimes as one or several sentences, sometimes consisting of longer passages, and occasionally even extending over a few pages. Now I come to the significance of Wittgenstein's diaristic and coded remarks within his philosophical remarks. After the reception, of Wittgenstein had mainly focused on the philosophical writings for decades. The discovery of his personal notes, as well as of his letters, has meanwhile led to an increasing interest in his life and personality. And many scholars and researchers have raised the questions whether one can speak of a connection between Wittgenstein's personal attitude to the world and his philosophical ideas. As can already be observed in Wittgenstein's coded entries during the First World War, there are various thoughts which gradually found their way into the philosophical part written in normal script. Above all, his preoccupation with ethical and religious questions which determine his coded remarks seem to have heavily influenced 
his philosophical reflections in the course of time. This can be already seen in 1916, where in the philosophical part, his thoughts now start to circle around the meaning of the world, God, the I as the bearer of the ethical, death, and, and so on. That is to say, metaphysical questions Wittgenstein explicitly avoided to treat within philosophy, yet he obviously longed to treat them somehow. Consequently, he approached these questions via the mystical, as well known from the last pages of the Tractatus. His turn to the mystical must be seen in connection with the ethical, in the sense of a devout and respectful attitude toward the realm which transcends the world of facts and is thus unassailable by language and by science. In later years, Wittgenstein continued to preoccupy himself with ethical and religious questions by frequent use of his code in his so-called diaristic remarks scattered throughout the Nachlass. Since his coded remarks have become widely accessible via the publication of culture and value, secret diaries and Denkbewegungen, not to mention the Bergen Electronic Edition, they are now frequently referred to as important sources among scholars with regard to various Wittgensteinian aspects and in order to emphasize the connection between his life and his philosophy. Wittgenstein himself hints at the connection between his philosophical thought and his personal situation with his notion of moral concepts. Quote, the movement of thought in my philosophizing ought to be discerned in the history of my mind, its moral concepts, and the understanding of my situation. End of quote. Given that most of Wittgenstein's diaristic remarks, be they autobiographical, religious or cultural, are written in code, the question arises whether these and some other aspects are related to one another and whether Wittgenstein intended them to be viewed and treated on a specific level. It seems as if they could be ordered according to a common cultural perspective and thus be described as elements of a unique form of expression. Nevertheless, opinions differ on the possibilities of ordering the remarks systematically according to certain criteria. In other words, there is no unanimous opinion as to whether these entries ought to be regarded from a purely personal point of view, from a cultural or ethical and religious perspective, or even to what extent these aspects are related to one another. The usual characteristic of personal entry as against philosophical entry cannot be applied indiscriminately to his coded entries. For Wittgenstein occasionally, both wrote philosophical reflections in code and then again quite banal remarks such as on the weather in normal script. Additionally, he encoded remarks on the nature of his philosophizing as well as his instructions for the publication of his philosophical work. This suggests that he was conscious of how easy his code was to decipher and in this sense it would be, appear inappropriate to associate his code with secrecy. Even though it is problematic to order all of the coded entries according to a common level, I dare say that they were not written by Wittgenstein accidentally. But they might be seen as a specific type of text in his oeuvre, where they hold a special position within the context of his philosophy. Similar to the remarks in Culture and Value, they hold what one could call a kind of middle position between personal and philosophical problems. They combine both reflections of Wittgenstein as a person and Wittgenstein as the philosopher and the critique of culture in their own specific way, by means not only by a different script, but also by characteristics of style, by a specific tone. Before discussing Wittgenstein's diaries, in more details, a few words about his attitude toward ethics, ethical and religious matters, visible in his coded remarks. Whereas in his philosophy, he avoided to treat them. <clears throat> in his diaristic remarks, we can observe an intense preoccupation with these matters arising from his very personal experience. A preoccupation that does not strive for theoretical explanation as he also mentions in a lecture on ethics. As he said to members of the Vienna Circle, 
regarding the concept of value. I would reply that whatever I was told, I would reject. And that not because the explanation was false, but because it was an explanation. And he continued, what is ethical cannot be taught. In addition, he emphasized the importance to speak in the first person at the end of his lecture on ethics. This stepping force as an individual, instead of giving a theory, can be seen as characteristic of his personal approach toward ethics. The questions he deemed essential should be touched on, but not made the subject of philosophical dispute. Instead, they should be relegated to a separate part of his work, the aspect he decided not to explicitly address in the written part of his philosophical work. For if such matters were expressed in everyday language or in the context of philosophical argumentation, then it would prove their nonsensicality. The encoding is thus a means to emphasize the distinction between meaningful and nonsensical propositions, that is to say, between the sayable and the unsayable, accentuated by a specific kind of script. <clears throat> now by the notebooks 1914 to 1916. The separation between personal and philosophical interests by different types of text is particularly obvious in his wartime notebooks, as mentioned before. However, this separation cannot be applied to all of his entries, for there are a few exceptions. In the first manuscript, Wittgenstein begins to report on personal matters in normal writing, starting on the 9th of August in 1914. Then on August 15th, in the middle of a sentence written in normal script, he continues to write in code. It is not before August 22nd that he begins to write his philosophical entries in a normal fashion on the right-hand side of his manuscripts, whilst he now puts his coded remarks on the left-hand side. As concerns the problematic topic of ethical and religious matters, a gradual mingling can be observed in some passages. That is to say, we can find philosophical reflections in the personal coded part, even essential thoughts that are then further developed in the philosophical part before they attain their final concentrated and precise form in the Tractatus. Thus Wittgenstein first writes the sentence, what cannot be said, cannot be said, in its determinate tone in code. On the same day, we find the following entry in the philosophical part of the notebooks. Isn't this the reason why man, to whom the meaning of life had become clear after long doubting, could not say what this meaning consisted in? Thus, on the same day as he reflects on the meaning of life, which he sees outside the world of facts, in the sphere of the ineffable, he in effect, in recognition of the problems not to be grasped in words, formulates the sentence about the impossibility of saying what cannot be said. One day later, on July the 8th, he writes, to believe in a God means to understand the question about the meaning of life. In the preceding passages, we find further reflections on the meaning of life, on God, the will, on conscience, fate, death, on time and eternity in the philosophical part. These entries reveal his gradual approach towards a personal God, one he had already often addressed in the coded remarks, presumably shaped by his wartime experiences, above all by the nearness of death, as well as by Tolstoy's gospel in brief. Still, there are also pantheistic and panentheistic tendencies, which can apparently be related to the philosophies of Spinoza and of Schopenhauer. But while these tendencies characterize the philosophical part of the notebooks, the coded parts reveal a religious attitude toward a personal God in a Christian sense. The impression that Wittgenstein's philosophical movements of thought were rooted in his personal experience is particularly relevant for the idea of a life in the present. On July the 8th, he noted in his philosophical notebook, only a man who lives not in time, but in the present is happy. For life in the present, there is no death. Reading Wittgenstein's coded diaries from the same time, one finds very similar thoughts that obviously originated in the extreme borderline situation of war. <clears throat> 
when he was daily confronted by death. On May the 4th, two months before his philosophical preoccupation with life and the present, he notes in quote, then war will finally begin for me, and maybe life as well. Perhaps the nearness of death will bring me the light of life. And a few days later, he notes that life gets its meaning through death. He continues to emphasize the importance of a happy life, which in an idealistic sense he sees in living in the good and in the beautiful until life ends itself. Instead, fear of the future and fear in the face of death is the best sign of a false, that is to say, a bad life. As a consequence, we can observe a tendency toward a kind of stoic attitude regarding the trappings, trappings and externalities of life, which Wittgenstein hoped to reach by an increasing inclination toward the spiritual, a life in the spirit, not unlike the Spinozian acceptance of one's fate as being God's plan. All these aspects characterize both the coded diary entries and the philosophical notes, which he regards as the work that prepared the way for the Tractatus. It has to be mentioned that these thoughts first occur in the coded part of the notebooks, and only later in MS 103 are introduced into the philosophical part. Thus it becomes obvious what kind of philosophy Wittgenstein himself seemed to need for his life in borderline situations such as those of the war, and how these thoughts eventually influenced his philosophical work. While in earlier years he was, he was above all preoccupied with the problems of language <coughs> excuse me, and its correct logical analysis, his reflections on language problems gradually turned to a level that lies beyond the issues to be treated in the world. Put in Wittgenstein's terms, a level which lies outside the world of facts and where the philosophical urge centers on the problem of life. However, since this fear belongs to the metaphysical, it cannot be verbalized and does not be explained rationally. It is noteworthy that on July the 8th, in 1916, Wittgenstein reports on his reflections about God and the sense of life, on time and eternity, on conscience and on the agreement with the world in the philosophical part. But in the coded part, he notes, what a pity I don't have time to work. The question arises whether he did not consider these reflections touching upon metaphysical questions as belonging to his philosophical work, as he emphasized in the Tractatus. However, this assumption seems to contradict the fact that he did take up these reflections on metaphysical problems in the Tractatus and thus into his philosophical work later on. Actually, there are several thoughts written in the last few pages of the wartime notebooks that I contend have their beginnings or roots in the earlier Cody diaries. For example, thoughts about the dependency upon the world and that of a life in the present, aspects upon which Wittgenstein first reflected in his personal diaries, and which later became the subject of his philosophizing also occur in the Tractatus. To my mind, he brought his reflections, often labeled as Wittgenstein's mystical thoughts, into his philosophical work in order to emphasize their different nature in contrast to his analytic preoccupation with philosophical problems, all the while hinting at their significance within philosophy. While in this instance, these remarks are written in normal script to be viewed as part of the whole, they nevertheless differ with regard to content and style. And as is well known, Wittgenstein hinted both in his foreword and on other occasions, for example, in his letter to Ludwig von Ficke at the importance of these thoughts. Wittgenstein's gradual preoccupation with existential problems of life, thus universal questions of philosophy, is clearly observable starting on May 23, 1915, at a time when his future role in the war was uncertain and his fears began to mount. His remarks now reflect Weininger's notion of the genius as being distinguished by an acute awareness, not only of the self, microcosm, but also of the outer world, microcosm. It is worth noting 
that in the borderline situation of the war, Wittgenstein became acutely aware of a sense of self within its surroundings, and that the entries about his existential position, written in code, gradually turn into reflections on the problem of life in general and of the philosophical eye in relation to the world. He now reflects on solipsism, on microcosm and macrocosm, and formulates sentences like the following. The eye, the eye, is what is deeply mysterious. The eye makes its appearance in philosophy through the world's being my world. It is true, man is the microcosm. I am my world. And he confesses that he once wanted to give his book the title, The World I Found. On May 25th, he writes that the drive toward the mystical comes from the dissatisfaction of our wishes by the sciences. And he adds the following sentence, which he later slightly altered in the Tractatus. We feel that even if all of the possible questions of science were answered, our problem is still left untouched. Of course, then no question remains, and this is exactly the answer. Even though in the reception most scholars refer to the Tractatus, assuming that Wittgenstein has selected what he considered the essence of his thoughts, one must not neglect the importance of the notebooks as preliminary steps to the Tractatus. According to Joachim Schulte, the spirit of the Tractatus is closer to the notebooks than to the later writings. Similarly, I dare say that the spirit of Wittgenstein's thoughts, as found in the notebooks, contains several aspects that have been developed from remarks uncoded in the personal diaries of that time. In so far as these remarks illuminate his very personal view on various matters, they reflect the importance of the uniqueness of the individual's consciousness and apprehension of the world, which Wittgenstein himself emphasized. Only from the consciousness of the uniqueness of my life arises religion, science, and art. Now, I've just a few words about Denkbewegung, movements of thought. In the, these end, um, there are coded remarks as well in this diary of the 1930s. And the entries, the personal entries, are written in normal fashion. Apart from cultural reflections, there are also a few philosophical entries on the idea, on archetype, and so on, on sign. Entries occurring in a similar form in the philosophical investigations. And Wittgenstein also handled also metaphysical questions in his diaries, but not coded and in a more general tone. However, when it came to his intensely personal struggles with ethics and religion, he made use of his code. And uh, th these coded remarks, they involve his doubts in, in a search for God, his wavering between religious devotion and skepticism, sometimes even rebellion. And they have a striking resemblance of those to the to those of the coded entries of the First World War. In several cases, the content and wording are almost identical. These involve his prayers written in utmost desperation. May God help, may God have mercy on me, and so on. Similarly, there are coded entries on his fear of losing his mind and ending in a form of madness. I think we have still time, um, yeah, a uh, few words about the rest of the heuristic uh, remarks in occurring amidst his philosophical entries. The question arises whether the coded remarks interspersed within the philosophical texts have some special value or significance, and whether there might be a connection between them and the philosophical entries. It is reasonable to ask whether these remarks, as mentioned before, might be seen as an example of Wittgenstein's philosophy of language, in so far as he regarded them as having a specific kind of function within language which could not be attained by normal usage and not by scholarly disputes. To give a concrete example, what significance do coded entries like the following have in connection with Wittgenstein's nature of philosophizing. Quote, 
Oh, why do I feel as if I wrote a poem when I write philosophy? It is here as if there was something small that has a wonderful meaning, like a leaf or a flower. End of quote. This remark seems to me a striking example of Wittgenstein's poetic approach toward philosophy, his attitude of wonder at the world, thus implying not only an thus implying not only an aesthetic but also an ethical component. By way of encoding, though, he still wanted to mark the difference between strict philosophizing in an analytic sense and philosophizing in an act of aesthetic, even poetic way. Wittgenstein wrote this passage amidst his preoccupation with the meaning of names within language games in normal script. However, as these remarks interrupt interrupt his philosophical discourse in the same sense as his reflections on cultural topics or his personal entries now and again spread over his manuscripts, Wittgenstein clearly separates them from the strictly philosophical discourse by means of a special kind of script. Yet it is not only the different type of writing, but also the tone and style that help distinguish these entries from the more dispassionate tone of his philosophical discourse. One could speak of two different voices of Wittgenstein's, the passionate voice of Wittgenstein as a person and the sober voice of the philosopher. In other words, the voice of heart versus the voice of mind. In addition, one can speak of a third voice, the, the one giving comments on his writings from a meta level. Whereas the relatively strict distinction between philosophical and personal ethical and religious entries according to normal writing on the one hand and coded on the other is, as previously mentioned, particularly relevant to Wittgenstein's wartime notebooks. We can find an intermingling of the two different types of text in later years. There are numerous reflections on cultural and ethical religious and matters, sometimes written in code and sometimes not. The encoded entries involve predominantly very personal remarks concerning God, that is to say prayers written in a passionate and at the same time devout tone, often with the formulation may the möge form, as also found in his wartime diaries, may God forbid, may God send me purity and truth, may God help hold my ideal up. It thus seems that the code was a means to express his awe and distant approach toward God a relationship too deep and precious as to be laid bare for others to see. So even if many of his reflections in, on religious belief are written in a normal script, Wittgenstein switches to code when the meta is extremely personal, thus his tone more passionate, obviously rooted in his personal despair. For example, this famous passage where he says, but, but if I'm to be really safe, what I need is certainty, not wisdom, dreams or speculation. And this certainty is faith, and faith is faith in what is needed by my heart, by my soul, not my speculative intelligence. For it is my soul with its passions, as it were, with its flesh and blood, that has to be saved, not my abstract mind. Perhaps we can say, only love can believe the resurrection, or it is love that believes the resurrection. During his long stay in Norway, when he spent a great deal of time in solitude, he wrote longer passages in code. And these were predominantly about his personal situation and as such substantiate one of the reasons he gave for writing diaries, that is to say, as a kind of substitute for a confidant. He reports on his fears of madness, illness or death, on his sufferings that reveal his deepest despair. God in my hands, I give myself, but if it is so, you have to accept it, and so on. Not unlike he did during the First World War, Wittgenstein again often reports on his philosophical work in code, although now in much greater detail. Most of what he has written he does not consider mature enough for a book and thus wants to rework it. Thus we can see how his coded entries provide us with a vivid picture of the reasons and methods for his numerous alterations, deletions, and so on in his philosophical manuscripts. 
There are fewer entries in code on religious matters, but whenever there are, his tone is, extent, is intense and devout, and he uses always this may möge form again. I come to the conclusion. When reading Wittgenstein's coded remarks in the context of his philosophizing, it seems obvious that he used the code, even if not always consistently, in order to draw a line between strict philosophical questions and those concerning his personal life, as well as the sphere of ethics and religion. Evidence for this reading is not only to be found in distinctions in the content and style of his writing, but also in the fact that before transferring his notebooks to volumes starting in Cambridge in 1929, he had written the coded remarks in normal script, but in brackets. This suggests that he used his code as a special kind of script for the problems that were not meant to be treated within philosophy, but rather in other forms of expression. Wittgenstein's code marks out problems that transcend the limits of language, the sphere lying outside the world of facts. Since these topics cannot be grasped by normal language, but only shown by different means, the mere attempt to express them in words would prove their nonsensicality. Thus, Wittgenstein utilized the code as a means to conceal or disguise these special topics, which he nevertheless longed to speak and write about somehow. As I've tried to show the use of normal and encoded writing as criteria for distinguishing philosophical from personal matters, as well as the sayable from the unsayable, can be observed in most, but not all of the Nachlass passages. Whether the reasons for these inconsistencies are the result of carelessness, negligence, and so on, due to the flow of writing or temporary weakening of resolve in pursuing this purpose is still unclear. <clears throat> However, despite these inconsistencies and in view of his remark, the limits of my language are the limits of my world, the method of encoding seems to have served him as a means to transgress the limits of the language in the sense of his language, in the sense of what can be verbalized, a venture by which, though he became aware of the nonsensicality of what he tried to put in words and thus chose the form of concealment. In view of his remark on the propositions in the scientific part of the Tractatus, which after having understood them, we would recognize as nonsense, Wittgenstein's coded remarks on ethical and religious questions might perhaps be considered as belonging to the essential but not written part of his work. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> <clears throat>